The Gulf Screen Girls Theater. The director of the Gulf Theater and your host, Roger Pryor. Good evening, everybody. Your neighborhood good Gulf dealer and the Gulf Oil Companies again welcome you to the Gulf Theater. And what a cast we have for you tonight. Loretta Young, Edward Arnold, James Stewart, Fuzzy Knight, and, as usual, Oscar Bradley and his Gulf Orchestra. Jimmy Stewart's about a step and a half behind himself these days. It seems he hopes to open his own candid camera exhibit in about three weeks. And so, after working all day at the studio, he's been rushing madly home to spend the evening dividing his time between a roll of film, a band of developer, and a rather bedraggled sandwich for dinner. Loretta Young deserves a prize for having discovered something brand new in the way of autograph hunters. This afternoon, Loretta was asked for her autograph. Not on a piece of paper, but in a block of wet cement. Loretta signed it all right with a ten-penny nail. And when last seen, the fan was staggering triumphantly down Hollywood Boulevard with his block of cement on his shoulder. You know, the stars get a tremendous kick out of appearing in the Gulf Theater. It's almost a contest to see who worked the hardest at rehearsals. That's because the Gulf Theater is the star's own theater. You see, every single cent that Gulf would ordinarily give to the stars who appear here is given instead to meet the needs of the Motion Picture Relief Fund and to build a home for the members of the picture industry who can no longer provide for themselves. And remember, in this same spirit of giving, you can lend a helping hand to your less fortunate neighbors this week by contributing to your community chest. So be a good neighbor and help out, won't you? And now it's time for me to assume my role as stage manager and call for lights. Music. Curtain. Our play, Going My Way, is a comedy adapted from an original screenplay by Alan Scott and W.W. W. Watson. And now I'd like you to meet the cast. Loretta Young. I play the part of Nancy Colway. James Stewart. I'm uh, Lewis Colway, Nancy's husband. Edward Arnold. I play the part of J.P. Hampton, owner of the big New York department show. Fuzzy Knight. Me? <laughs> well, I'm the other thing, I'll Going up? And I'm Don Hampton, J.P.'s son. <laughs> As the play begins, Lewis is speaking to his employer, J.P. Hampton, over the phone. Yes, Miss Hampton. No, Miss Hampton. Yes, Miss Hampton. Yes, Miss Hampton. I mean, no, 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 Miss Hampton. Oh, yes, Miss Hampton. <laughs> That's Sellingham, Lewis. That's Sellingham. Well, Nancy, right? Mm-hmm, my Nancy. Mm. Oh, what are you doing here? Why aren't you at home? Something wrong? Is it wrong for a wife to come to her husband's office? Yeah, but do you realize you're absolutely smashing Rule 24? Then I'm a bad girl. Yeah, well, Rule 24 clearly states that wives of employees shall not disturb business routine by social call. Rule 24 doesn't apply, because this is not a social call. Now, look, Nancy, can't just wait until I get home. That's just it, Lewis. You never come home. Well, I know, last night. I know. And the night before, and the night before that. I know, Nancy. We're right now in the Hollywood Day season, you know. Do you realize the last time you took me to the movies, they were still showing silent pictures? Now, look, I, uh, <laughs> I, I don't mean to. And I can't remember the last time I had a chance to wear my evening gown. But I could wear it now, all right. Bustles are right back in style again. Oh, darling. No, no, that's no way to look at it. No, it isn't, huh? Well, how would you like to wait dinner night after night for someone who never gets there? Tuesday night I waited dinner for you and you didn't show up. Thursday night you didn't show up. Friday night you didn't show up. Why, I'm married to the little man who wasn't there. I'm through, Lewis. I'm finished. Oh, what do you mean? I mean, I've walked out on you. I moved to a hotel today and I'm registered under my maiden name. Nancy French, remember? Oh, wait. Now, you can't do that. Though. Why not? Well, in the first place, I love you. In the second place, J.P. Hampton won't stand for it. He, he believes wives and husbands should live together. Oh, so J.P. Hampton won't stand for it. Very well, then we'll get a divorce. Oh, don't, don't, don't say that, Nancy. Now, that someone might hear you. You don't realize how Mr. Hampton feels about that, that, uh, that word. Oh. Here, here, look at the Monday morning message he sent. Read it. Mm, marriage is a business, and a man who can't make a success in marriage can't make a success in business. And, uh, well, you see, we can't possibly get a divorce. No, can't we? Well, and besides, what would happen to you? Happen to me, why, darling, I get a job, of course. Well, uh, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard of. How is it? Oh, certainly. Now, you run along home. Now, uh, you can get the 410 if you're hurrying. Goodbye, darling. Now, I'll be there for dinner. I think. You think? <laughs> darling, this is going to hurt you a lot more than it does me. Yeah, well, I'll phone you from the station. What? What'd you say? I will illustrate in three easy steps. 
Do you see this lamp? Yeah, that lamp department. It's 4250. No, dear. This represents our home. Oh, Nancy. It's now broken. Now, wait a minute. You observed this vase? Now, look, Nancy, please. This vase is our marriage. We are divorced. Nancy, will you stop your ruining my office? Did you observe this bust of Mr. Hampton? Oh, Nancy, now come back here with Mr. Hampton. You will just try and make me. That's all I have to do. Nancy, take it easy. Now put Mr. Hampton down. Okay, you asked for it. Yep, yep, there he is. Nancy. Nancy, if I ever get my hands on you... Oh, you can't fight me, you big brute. Come on, come on out here from under that desk. I will not come out. I will not. Say, hey, Lewis, what's this plaster all over the floor? Plaster? What plaster? Oh, it's searched from the ceiling. It falls down all the time. <laughs> Is it Lewis? Uh, no, I'm just finishing up some window displays. Oh, I was wondering what that dummy was doing under your desk. Hey, huh? no one can call me a dummy and get away with it. What was that? What? Well, uh, I'm sorry. The dummy. I mean, the uh, lady under the desk is my wife's uh, dearest friend. Meet the... Uh, meet... Um, French. Yeah, French. Come, you can come out, Miss French. That's Miss <laughs> Nancy French. Uh-huh. Yeah, this is uh, Don Hampton, our personnel manager. Oh, well, how do you do? Hmm, how do you do? <laughs> oh, uh, Don Hampton is my boss's son. And I don't let that tell you, Miss French. I take after my mother's side of the family. Uh-huh. Uh, Miss French was just looking for something. Oh, what was it? Oh, what was it? Uh, a job. A job? Uh-huh. Well, that's strange. I never heard of anyone looking for a job under a desk. Oh, I'll work anywhere. <laughs> Look, Don, if you have anything else to do... Well, of course, we have a lot of jobs around here, Miss French. Uh, we hire people all the time. Well, that's lovely. Now, look here, Miss French. Uh, if you... Uh, you don't want to take anything that comes along here, you know. You have a special talent. Oh, have I? Uh, yes. And yeah. besides, Don, she's going back to Youngstown tomorrow. She got a letter from her mother. Uh, uh, excuse me. No. Yeah? Hello? Oh. Come away. Come away. Come up here right away. Yeah. Oh, yes, Mr. Hampton. I'll write it right in. In case I don't see you again, Miss French, uh, goodbye. Well, I think I ought to pick up these things that uh, you dropped on the floor, don't you? Uh, yes, Miss French, and I'll help you. Uh-huh. Uh, look, uh, I sort of like my office on Friday. It sort of makes me look dizzy. I don't like to... Yes? Come on, I'm waiting for you. Yeah, all right, Mr. Hampton, I'm coming. <laughs> my floor, Grandfather Clock, stuffed fish, and peach, and Mr. J.P. Hampton. for this promotion. You set a shining example for the rest of our employees. I'll take our Western sales representative. He's getting a loss. And a man who is disloyal to his wife is just as likely to be disloyal to his employer. Right? Yes, Mr. Hampton. If a man's home life is upset, how can his business life be otherwise? Right? Yes, Mr. Hampton. There isn't a divorced man in my organization. When a man is divorced, he is automatically liquidated. Right? Yes, Mr. Hampton. Thank you. You, you never have any trouble with your wife, do you? Yes, Mr. Hampton. What? No, no. Yeah. I mean, no, Mr. Hampton. Go ahead. She'd be proud of you to, to, proud to know that I intend to have you elected to an officership. Well, I'm glad to know that you have that much faith in me, Mr. Well, Hampton. I have. That's why I'm letting you teach my son the business. Uh, confidentially, how is Don doing? Well, he's picking up things. Ah, oh, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> now, as you know, Calway, I'm leaving for our Chicago office tonight, and I'm placing everything in your hands. Yes, Mr. Hampton. Eighth floor, leftovers, marked down. Please get off my foot, lady. Thank you. Second, door mat, Mr. Lewis Carway. Your father, that's what you... Oh. oh, I thought you'd gone by now, Miss French. I was just leaving. Goodbye, Don. Don. Bye, Nancy. Oh, Nancy. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Carway. Oh, it's Mr. Carway. <laughs> Bye. See you tomorrow morning at nine. Oh, that's right. At nine. <laughs> oh, see you tomorrow morning at nine. Everything's all fixed up. It certainly huh? is. Right. Now, see here, Miss French. What have you been saying to my boss's son? Oh, correction, please. You mean our boss's son. Oh, Nancy. Yes, Lewis? Uh, may I take you for a drive? Oh, I'm sorry, but Don's taking me for a walk. <laughs> Yes, Lewis. I'll take you for a walk. Oh, I'm sorry, but Don's taking me for a drive. Oh, Nancy. Yes, Don? Oh, uh, Lewis? Oh, uh, well, never mind. Oh, 
But, Lewis, you aren't eating a thing. No, I can't eat. Now, listen, Nancy, you realize this is the first time we've been together in three weeks? Well, you know, I've been so terribly busy since Don put me in charge of Drake. Yeah, Don, Don, that's all I hear is Don. Now, look, Nancy, Don only gave you the job because you have a pretty face. Nancy, your place is in the home, our home. Oh, Lewis, say that again. So you mean about the home? Huh. No, about the pretty face. Oh, Nancy, Nancy. You don't belong in business. Now, statistics show that women are losing ground in business every day. According to the UVNM survey of the last fiscal year, in November there were 5,437,000 in business. In December shows 4,294,000. And all January has is a measly 3,576,942. Except February, which has 28. Nancy, I'm only trying to make you realize that for generations men have been running things. You Can't you understand? It's a man's world. Yeah, and look at it. Yeah, I did. But uh, from now on... I'll do anything to prove to you that you don't belong in business. Hey, look, Lewis, I'm getting sick of arguing. I think I'll go now. Oh, but Nancy, wait, your lunch. What? I'm sorry, Lewis, but uh, all of a sudden I'm on a diet. Goodbye. Eight floor, cut supplies, guppies, goldfish, muzzles, dog houses, <laughs> and Mr. Lewis Caldwell. <laughs> Hello, Lewis. What are you happy about? Oh, Lewis, the greatest thing has happened to me. Congratulate me. Nancy and I are engaged. What? Uh-huh. We're going to be married. Married? Yep, that's right. And to show you how grateful I am to you for bringing us together, you're going to be the best man. Now, isn't that swell? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Isn't it great the way things have turned out? Me marrying Nancy, your wife's best friend? My wife's best friend, yeah. Yeah, oh, can't yeah, you just see it, Lewis? Nancy and I, your wife and you, going around together. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The three of us are going to be very happy. <laughs> Oh, street floor. Hey, buddy. Next time, take that ice up on the service elevator. Windbreakers, red flannel, skis, <laughs> snowshoes, and John Conti. Well, folks, I'm in charge of the, uh, gosh, it'll soon be winter department. And I don't need to remind any of you that nowadays your car can be even more useful to you during the winter than it is in summer. And I don't have to remind you either that there are lots of little things that should be done to your car before the winter season gets underway. That's why your good golf dealer has put out a big sign with a laughing man on it. And that sign tells you that your good golf dealer is ready to help you laugh at winter. You already know about quick-starting, free-flowing golf tried motor oil and about quick-starting golf no-knock gasoline. Well, in addition, your golf man is ready with other special services. Golf Flex registered lubrication, as well as a new golf antifreeze if you live up north, and everything you need for golf's complete winter guard service. So why not drive into your good golf dealers tomorrow and have your car prepared for colder weather? You can laugh at winter if you look for the laughing man under the sign of the golf orange disc. Thank you, John Connie. And now it's time for Act Two of our play, Going My Way, with Loretta Young, Edward Arnold, Jimmy Stewart, and Fuzzy Knight. So we call for light. Music. Curtain. As the curtain rises on Act Two, it's two weeks later, at the end of another business day. As the Fifth Avenue bus stops at the corner of the Hampton Building, Nancy Colway boards it and climbs to the upper deck. I beg your pardon. Would you mind moving over, please? Oh, sure. sure. Oh, Nancy, what, how'd you get on this bus? Oh, it was quite simple. I just stopped at the corner and held up my finger, and the bus stopped, and the driver said, Madam, do you want a bus, or are you trucking? And so I got on. Oh, that's, that's very funny, Miss French. Yes, I thought so. <laughs> oh, well, darling, what's the matter? You can't even say hello to me. Yeah. Hello. Oh, that's my little son, Dean. Oh, really, Lewis, what's eating you? After all, Mr. Hampton is coming back to Chicago tomorrow, and it's... Well, it's common gossip that your promotion's been passed. But for your information, Miss French, I wasn't thinking about my promotion or my job, and incidentally, congratulations. Congratulations? What do you mean? You know what I mean, and I wish you'd stop evading the issue. After all, I'm... They got a match, bud? No! This so happens, Nancy. Hey, you got one, lady? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, here we are. I was trying to tell you... Do you mind if I keep him? Uh, no, that's all right. Go right in. You would like to read my newspaper, too, would you? Yeah, thanks. Oh, he can read, too. <laughs> Now, listen to me, Nancy. I admit I have no right to tell you who you can marry, but at least you could have told me about yourself and Don. Who said I was marrying Don? Who said you wouldn't? Well, he proposed to you, didn't he? Well, what harm is there in a proposal? 
after all, you proposed to me once yourself, remember? Yeah? Mm-hmm. Well, oh, well, yes. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, anyway, I don't like the idea of other people proposing to my wife. And besides, you're just trying to talk your way out of it. Now, look, I'm not trying to talk my way out of anything. I'm stop shouting. Hey, why don't you two get married? For your information, buddy, we are married. Oh. And another thing, Nancy. I, I... Well, why don't you get divorced? We are getting divorced. Oh. You got any more ideas, chump? No, this is where I get off. <laughs> That's the best, the best idea I've heard yet. I'll talk with you. Quick Floor, Commission Blinds, Lace Barley, Love Seats, Etchings, and Mr. Donald Hampton. Oh, hello, Nancy. Nancy, how would you like... What's the matter, Nancy? You look worried. Something wrong in your department? Uh, no, Don. I think there's something wrong in your department, though. Huh? If I hadn't spoken to Lewis last night, this telegram might have been a surprise to me. Telegram? What telegram? Uh, this one from your father. He's now always a businessman. Just listen to it. My dear Miss French, stop. Congratulations, stop. Don has told me you promised Marion, stop. My blessings upon this merger and may the years bring many little happy branches of your own. <laughs> Say, father has a sense of humor. <laughs> well, I haven't. If you think I'm going to marry you and have a lot of little branches, you're crazy. Oh, but Nancy... Now, Donald Hampton, I never said I'd marry you. Oh, now, don't fly off the handle, Nancy. Please, take some time to think it over. Take a week. It'll take two weeks. Take three. Do I hear far? Oh, now, Nancy, don't you realize there's a man for every girl in the world? Mm. And I had to hit the jackpot. <laughs> this floor, hot air conditioning, ear mouth, loud speakers, auditorium... Now, get, get set now. He's on his way out now, just as soon as he opens the door. Now, get ready now. Okay, all together now. Well, Welcome home, Mr. Hampton. Thank you, thank you, my loyal employees. It's a wonderful feeling to see such happy, smiling faces. It reminds me of the Chicago office. Everyone was so happy when I left. <laughs> <laughs> and now, now for the important news. I have with me a list of all the promotions that have been passed. Wait a minute. To make this a truly happy occasion, I want all married employees to telephone their wives and have them at the auditorium within an hour. I lose much time, so you better hurry, that's all. And Lloyd. Oh, yes, Mr. Hampton. I'm particularly looking forward to you uh, meeting your wife. You'll call her, of course. Call my wife, sir. Uh, oh, yeah, yes, Mr. Hampton. Yeah. Oh, I gotta call my wife, huh? I've got to tell her to be here in an hour, I guess. Nice floor, 18th century ornament, suits of armor, fencing foils, battle axes, and J.P. Hampton. I can't tell you how happy I am that you're marrying Don. Oh, Mr. Hampton, I, uh... Oh, call me Papa. <laughs> Very well, Papa. <laughs> yes, I have a wonderful surprise for you, my dear. On your wedding day, we'll have a 10% discount sale. Oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> Nancy, uh, when will it be? Oh, I'd say in about, um, uh, six months. Six months? Uh-huh. My dear, why wait that long? Well, first I've got to get a divorce. Divorce? Uh-huh. Did you say divorce? Yes, Papa. I can't marry a divorcee. It's against our principles. I'm sorry, Miss French, but there will be no marriage. Yes, Papa. And stop calling me Papa. You're fired. <laughs> Eight floor, rattle, baby blocks, paper dolls, did you do six floor puzzles, and Mr. Lewis Calway. And that, that woman? Now, if you look up her record, you'll learn that she's one of your most efficient employees. But she's a divorcee! You know how I feel about that. Now, Mr. Hampton, you only know that she's a divorcee, but I know the circumstances. You mean to say you know a husband? Yes, I do, Mr. Hampton. A scoundrel, if ever there was one, and she a sweet, impressionable young girl, and he a, he a dapper, swashbuckling roué with a sneer on his lips. So what chance did she have? Go on, go on. Well, day after day and night after night, she'd sit home alone and knit... Pearl one, drop two, pearl one, <laughs> drop two, pearl one, drop two more, pearl... Gosh, that's monotonous. Uh, it is. 
And where was the husband? Oh, he was running around pool rooms, gambling ship. A gambling ship? Yeah, he swam home from two once. <laughs> why, why, that's awful. That's, that's terrible. That's quick, down and run after Miss French and, and bring the poor creature back here. Yes, sir. Now, Lewis, if you hadn't told me these things, I would have committed a great injustice against this girl. She deserves admiration, not condemnation. Now, Mr. Hampton, you've convinced me. All right, better be going now. Oh, no, you don't. No, you don't. You deserve the satisfaction of seeing her face light up when I tell her what you have done for her. No, no, Mr. Hampton, that isn't necessary. When when you've seen one face light up, you've seen them all. <laughs> Nancy? Yeah, and here's Nancy. And here's a telegram for you. Don't bother me with telegrams now. Read it yourself. Somebody, please tell me what this is all about. My right? dear, I owe you an apology. You do? Yes, you belong here. You had an unhappy marriage, but it wasn't your fault. Lord just told us all about it. He did. Lewis, you told him about our marriage to save me. Our marriage? You mean you and Lewis are married? Lewis! Well, they, 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 you're the scoundrel, the, the, the swashbuckling police act. Oh, Lewis, did you say all those awful things about yourself to protect me? Oh, well, Nancy, uh, I just... Well, I, don't believe him, Mr. Hanson. He's not a pool shark. If he ran around, around pool rooms, it was all my fault. I put him behind the eight ball. Oh, it was your fault. Now, don't believe her, Mr. Hampton. She's been a model wife, and if I was behind the eight ball, that's where I wanted to be. It's sort of shady back there. <laughs> I can see through the whole thing. You've been tricking me. Say, Dad, this telegram. Don't interfere with any telegrams. I don't care about telegrams. Lewis, you pretended to live up to every Hampton rule. You not only broke them, but you, you parted them in my face. Oh, but Mr. Hampton. Lewis, I can't have any more faith in your marriage. You are tied with the most serious rule of them all. The divorce rule. Lewis, you're fired. Oh, but you can't do that, Mr. Hampton. Lewis. Don't tell me what to do, Mrs. Mrs. Poolshark. <laughs> You're fired, too. Say, Dad, this telegram, it's from Mother. Oh, who? Mother? Mother, yes, Mother. You remember, your wife. <laughs> yes, yes, oh, yes. Where is she now? She's in Reno. Reno? Yes, Reno. She's going to get a divorce. What? Oh, 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 so, Mr. Hampton, you're going to get a divorce, eh? What is that? I mean, did you say Mr. Hampton's getting a divorce? Yes, isn't that all? Listen, Hampton, I'll take over here. You run out to our Reno branch and settle up that unfinished business, understand? Who do you think you're talking to? He's talking to a man who's going to get a divorce. <laughs> yes. Right. Uh, that beats with your approval, doesn't it? Yes, Mr. Hampton. Yes, Mr. Hampton. Yes, Mr. Hampton. Well, if a man can't make a success in marriage, he can't make a success in business, right? Yes, Mr. Conway. Who do you think you're talking to? He's talking to a man who's going to get a divorce! All right, all right. <laughs> Better leave in the morning, Hampton, and remember, if a man can't make a success in marriage, he can't make a success in business. Right? Yes, Mr. Conway. <laughs> Get in there. And go in for one, buddy. Next car, please. Well, wait a minute. Hey, wait. Now, you can't do this to me. I'm white friendly. Oh, Mr. Hampton, I can't believe it. Well, John, come. Oh, no. Well, Johnny. Really? Why, Johnny, I didn't recognize you. The last time I saw you, you were wearing baggy trees and a bow tie and... Well, look at you now. You're the best-dressed man in radio. Well, are we ready? Uh, just a minute, Rog, before you begin. Um, tell me, um, who is that good-looking young man over there? Ah, now, now, Loretta, you mustn't point. That's John Conti. John Conti? Oh, no! Well, Johnny! Loretta! Why, Johnny, I didn't recognize you. The last time I saw you, you were wearing baggy trees and a bow tie, and... Well, look at you now. You're the best... ...protection against motor knock. Because motor knocks are not only annoying... They're also a common cause of wasted power and possible repair bills. Well, as you probably know, ladies and gentlemen, protection against motor knocks is buy clothes, but when you buy food or gasoline, you want extra quality, especially when you buy gas, because then you want to be sure that you get really effective protection against motor knocks. Because motor knocks are not only annoying, they're also a common cause of wasted power and possible repair bills. 
Well, as you probably know, ladies and gentlemen, protect the regular gas can possibly give you the same protection against motor knock. That's why if you want modern 1940 performance from your car this year, you should be sure to stop at the sign of the orange disc and... What's more, no regular gas of any make, no matter what claims may be made for it, gives you as high an octane rating as no knock. And therefore, no regular gas can possibly give you the same protection against motor knock. That's why if you want modern 1940 performance from your car this year, you should be sure to stop at the sign of the... No, no, I don't think... No, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I think he did a, uh, a double talk song in uh, uh, modern times. Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Maxwell House Good News Show. Ready? Uh, Eddie? Well, Eddie, now, yeah, now, right, first question is this. Have, uh, have you ever heard Charlie Chaplin's voice on the screen? No, no, I don't think... No, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> I think he did a, uh, a double talk song in... Uh, 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 modern times? Yeah. They're right? Mm. Think hard now. I give up quick. You give up quickly? Well, I'm afraid we'll have a forfeit because it would be James Cagney. Because he does paint a lot and very well, too. Now, let's go, Loretta, for your forfeit. Now, let me see. I have one all prepared and a very good one. Here is a eternally yours. Uh, Loretta, if you saw a painting signed with the initials J.C., would that stand for Joan Crawford, James Cagney, or John Conley? Mm. Think hard now. I give up quick. You give up quickly? Well, I'm afraid we'll have a forfeit because it would be James Cagney because he does paint a lot and very well, too. Now, let's go, Loretta, for your forfeit. Now, let me see. I have one all... Well, Loretta, thank you. 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 Thank
John Charles Thomas and more of your favorite stars. Stars who are at present on the Broadway stage or busy in radio instead of out here in Hollywood making pictures. They want to appear in the Gulf Theater, too, because the Gulf Theater is the star's own theater. You see, every single cent that Gulf would ordinarily give to the stars who appear here is given instead to help meet the needs of the Motion Picture Relief Fund and to build a home for the members of the motion picture industry who can no longer provide for themselves. But more about that next week. Now, it's time for lights. Music. Curtain. The scene of our play, The Beachcomber, is a small speck of a tropical island, and here we meet Ginger Ted, a dissolute beachcomber as personated by Charles Lawton. His friend, Greuter, the Dutch controleur of the island, is played by Jean Herschel. Ginger's enemies are two people who are devoting their lives to humanitarian service. Martha Jones, played by Elsa Lanchester, and her brother Owen, enacted by Reginald Owen. Our curtain rises on the courtroom. The controleur is the judge, and Ginger the prisoner. Miss Jones and brother Owen are his accusers. Order in the court. Order in the court. Well, Jen... <clears throat> Mr. Wilson, what is it this time? Oh, I wrecked the Chinaman's shop and bashed the sergeant right enough. But look at the provocation I had. If he's referring to my sister... Yes, that old clothesline ties me up in knots every time she comes anywhere near me. Mine have great heart. I, 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 I can defend myself. Yeah. Mr. Wilson, you are the prisoner if you follow me. Now, Miss Jones. Miss Dog in the manger. Keep the communications corrupt good manners. No. I warned you, Wilson. Go on, Miss Jones. I found the prisoner in a wine shop with one of my pupils. He was inciting her to be wicked. Yeah, and she hit me with an umbrella. Old hands scratching away at other people's business. We are trying to help these people find the truth. But how are we to guide them if this so-called white man mocks at us? You sentimental suction pump. Taking all the fun out of life. That man is a peril to women. And you're a thorn in the flesh of man. Mr. Greuter, I am not on trial here. Are those noises in order, Mr. Greuter? Oh. There he goes again. Order. Order, please. Now, Miss Jones, in regards to Ginger, what would you suggest? Deportation. I'm sorry, but it's necessary. Uh, perhaps you're right. Deport me? Hey. I'll pay for the Chinaman's stuff I broke if you'll give me time. Mm, you'll pay for the damage, all right. But it's me who'll give you the time. And that'll be three months. Hey, for me? At hard labor. What did you say? Under oath, gang. Who? Me? Let me go. Order. Order the court. <laughs> Him, Mr. Greuter. Pack him out like an offending eye. Mm -hmm. Oh, heaven knows. I promised myself often enough that I would deport him. Oh, I knew you'd see the light. Yeah, I've sent for Mr. Wilson. Yeah. Oh! Oh, come on. I can't bear to be near that man. Good day. Come here, Ginger. It does stick in my craw. You giving way to that twitty twerp. Ah, sit down. Do you? Yeah. Don't mind if I do. Close it. Down the hatch. <sighs> Have one of your own cigars. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, Ginger, I don't know what to do with you. Neither did anybody at home. I was a problem child. Oh, can't you control yourself? I made practically a companion of you, and you're behaving like this. Oh, it hurts, Ginger. Hey. I'll do that work on the road gang for you. No, no, no. Well, it's your duty to punish me. Oh, but an Englishman on a native road gang. Oh, I never thought of that. Well, couldn't you just put me in jail? And have my government him and haw at me for feeding you for three months? <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah. There it is. What shall we do? Uh, there must be some. Ginger. I've got it. I shall send you to Echo Island. There's no punishment. It will be, Ginger. There's no alcohol on Echo. Hi, what you say? Your father 
Mrs. Donald and my lady, I am Miss Jones. Wouldn't it be better if I stayed for dinner so much? No, 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 no. You haven't been near us since the trial a fortnight ago. It isn't at all inconvenient, Mr. Greuter. Who is it, Martha? It's the controller, dear. Oh, well, leave the door ajar, sister. Then I can chaperone you. Yes, sir. I've got a real English dinner for you tonight. My dear controller. Yes, when the dangers are fast for oh. go, you come on them here and wreck that the Kapala Aldar who are in signal buoy kept out. Mm. Well, what does he say? The chief on Ego Island has a little appendix. Appendicitis? It'll have to be operated on at once. Well, since your brother's in bed with fever, I'm afraid the appendix will have to be qualified. You can move an appendix, can you? Oh, I've helped her in scores of times. Oh, oh, an acute oh, appendix is nothing to dawdle over. I know. The poor soul might but... die. I'll, I'll get the necessary things together straight away. Oh, I'm thankful that woman is not a sister of mine. The chief will now be well and strong, Nona Jones. Yes, Sergeant. I may say the chief's operation was very successful. Oh, I've always liked Agar Island. I think I shall take a little walk while we're waiting for the launch. Nature's so uh, natural, isn't it? Coconut meal. Ah, oh, go away. Please, for Taila. Yes. A smell of milk like a blasted baby. <laughs> Stop here now. I'll bet the controller is drinking his beer and laughing at me. Ginger. Oh, shut up. Leave me alone, Taila. You don't like me. Well, you do as a barmaid. You think I am pretty? Yeah, you're pretty. Pretty as the girls where you come from. Oh, the barmaid's eyes are blue, not black at home in England. And when it's cold, her cheeks are red as apples. You can fill your lungs with clean, bright coals in England, paint pictures with your frozen breath, and your boots make music in the snow in wintertime at home in England. That is nice. <laughs> Even if I cannot understand Wait. it, is... Help! Help! No! It is not your job! Oh, help. help! It's the tea kettle! Oh, Lying in a hammock surrounded by native girls? Ah, dry. Don't you dare open your mouth to me, you unregenerate man. So this is the sort of punishment the controller sent you to. Get to your feet. Sergeant, take this man into custody. There you are, living in pagan idleness instead of reforming yourself by responsibility and trust. You've as much backbone as you have conscience. Well, you've had your chance to reform and lost it. Now you'll be really deported if I have to go to the government over the head of the controller. Aren't you listening to me? No. Oh! No, no, don't. You must keep seated, please. The channel is very narrow here. Sailing, sailing over the bounding main. The only man is vile. Hey, Sergeant, will you toss me up that jug? There'll be no drinking while I'm on board. Sergeant. Did Madam, you hear me? Madam, they can hear you in Honolulu. Give me that jug. I won't. Give it to me. Take your hands off. Give it to me, I say. I'll give you something. The reef, look out. Uh, uh, you uh. see, I told you to keep seated. What happened? You rocked the boat and the propeller hit the reef. Now you're satisfied? You better try and make that island, Sergeant. Sergeant, I order you to continue on our way home. Shut up. If we can make that island... Sergeant, we'll put on the spare tire in the morning. In the morning? Yeah. Does, does that mean that we shall have to stay here all night? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> Even you must realize I can't spend the night on an uninhabited island with two men. Do I have to draw a diagram of it oh, for you? No, 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 no. It's quite impossible. I said it's quite, quite impossible. I'll wait ashore and carry you. You'll get a bit wet, but when we get there, you can take off your skirt and dry out. Uh, uh, Mr. Wilson... You must have a mother or sister, perhaps. Come here. Well, please, please let me go. Oh, stop yowling and save your breath. Sailing, oh, sailing oh, over the mountain oh, And 
close the curtain calls on Act One of the Beach Coma. Ladies and gentlemen, the one minute of silence observed yesterday by millions of American men and women is dramatic proof that the United States is one great nation joined together by the bond of sympathy and understanding of its people. Thousands of square miles that might be divided into a dozen different countries are at peace under one flag. Tonight, I'd like to suggest that we ask ourselves, what are some of the things that help keep us united? For the most part, they're simple things, things that go to make up our everyday life. The common language, common customs, radio programs to which we all listen, and perhaps most of all, the automobile outside your door. For that automobile, combined with the good roads that America has built for it, makes all Americans neighbors, good neighbors. That's why, in behalf of the Gulf Oil Companies and of your neighborhood good Gulf dealer, I'd like to express to all of you our pride in being a part of the American scheme of things and helping in the work of keeping this country the United States. The curtain of the Gulf Screen Guild Theater is about to rise on the second act of The Beachcomber. Starring Charles Lawton, Elder Lanchester, Gene Herschel, and Reginald Owen. Lights! Music! Curtain! It's evening of the next day. The repaired launch has returned from the desert island with Ginger and Miss Jones. Ginger is having dinner with the controller. <laughs> <laughs> you talked to you a blue in the face, didn't you? But I don't believe you. It was awful on Agor Island. Ah, you are a liar. <laughs> Have you ever lived for three months on coconut milk? Well, no. But, uh... Who's that? Sounds like that blasted brother of Miss Jones. Well, oh. oh, there you are. Yeah. You must excuse me for dashing in. But when I heard Wilson was here, I simply had to come. Wilson, thank you. Thank you, Wilson. You've done a great and noble thing, Wilson. I beg your pardon? My sister Martha was right. There is so much good even in the worst of us. I misjudged you, Wilson, and I beg your forgiveness from the bottom of a very full heart. Guy's feverish, Conqueror. He had my sister at his mercy on that lonely, uninhabited island, and he spared her. What? We see him now in his true colors at last. Don't we, Consular? What? My God bless and guard you, Mr. Wilson. You must excuse me for dashing away so quickly, but my sister's not quite herself. Edward. I may call you Edward. Thank you again, and good night, Edward. <laughs> good night, Consular. <laughs> Didn't he call me Edward? <laughs> what did that check in the box mean? Oh, 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 oh you... He was thanking you, Ginger, because when you had his sister on your paw... What did I do? He was picked as her virtue and didn't force your attention. <laughs> hey, do you mean me and her? <laughs> it's an insult. You take it back. Oh, all this time it must have been. It must have been what? <laughs> it must have been love. Why, you... Uh... I didn't mean to hit him so hard. I'd better get lit. I'll stay stewed for a week. Not to me, not to me, not to me. Here we go, Gavin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what are you up to? You meddlesome Matty, get out of my house. House? More like a big sign. Oh, shut up, Leah. What are those you got? Clothes. My brother thought you might not be offended if we lent you something so that you could come and dine with us. Oh, he did, did he? Well, I bet you put him up to it. Mr. Wilson, my brother and I count ourselves your friends, and we consider that you need help, and help you will be whether you like it or not. Uh, now, let's now have no more nonsense. Wash and shave yourself, and put on these clothes and come to our house for dinner. <laughs> I'm afraid he isn't coming, Martha. It's only eight. Your stew will be a bit stale. Oh, thank you not to keep talking about it, Owen. Martha. Oh, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> there he is now. I go. Oh, Miss Jones. Oh, Mr. Grotter. Come in. 
I'm sorry to disturb you at this hour, but... Something wrong? Yes. You're needed on one of Sombo Island. Typhoid. Epidemic proportions, I'm afraid. Oh. I'll start at once. I'll pack for you, Owen. Excuse me, Mr. Gator. Of course. It's fortunate I have plenty of serum. Yes, watch out for trouble when you go to inoculate. They're savages. And if they are aroused by you... I appreciated the difficulties when I chose my life's work. Ginger! Here are your clothes, Jones. What do you mean? Maybe they'll fit the next dummy that comes around here. Ginger, get out. Do you hear me? Get out. I'm getting out all right on tomorrow's boat. Do you think I want to be made a laughing stock of? Who's making you one? That sister of yours. She's got me developing a case of nerves. Well, at this moment, there's nothing of less importance than your nerves. No, why? What's up? Typhoid. One of Sombo Island. Extremely serious. Oh, so long, Consular. I shall miss your company, but you can't have everything. And what I want now is peace. Peace comes from within. You put a sock in that. I was brought up on that stuff. Wilson, Mr. Jones has always tried to help you. Well, it was his duty, wasn't it? To a fellow man, a fellow Englishman in distress. No more. Now, we have a duty for you. I've served my time. You are one of us here, and you're needed. What, me? Leap into an epidemic? Now, Wilson. see here, Wilson. These natives will have to be forced to cooperate. I could do with a man there. Me? Yes. Yeah, Barney. No, he'd rather stay south to the ears. No, I don't think so. After all, Wilson, you are a man, aren't you? Well, what about it? Okay. Thank you. Look out. Oh, Miss Jones. Owen's painted. Owen, Owen, what is it? All right, I've got him. Owen. Oh, it's a relapse. Carry him into the bedroom. Give me a hand, Cotillard. Surely. Well... This ends the expedition to one Sombo. No, no. I'll go. I'll go in my brother's place. That lets me out. What does, what does he mean? Well, Ginger has agreed to go with Mr. Jones. Because if you're going in your brother's place, well then... With her? Mm. No. Mr. Wilson! Mr. Wilson! Mr. Wilson. You're not drunk now? No. And you won't come? With you? No. After all, there's no reason why you should come. It, it is my job. I can go alone. Oh, well, uh... Mr. Grider. Yes, Mr. Grider. Look at that one. I'd better go. He's gone, Mr. Jones. I didn't think it was in him. Poor Edward. I doubt whether after that night on the island, Edward has a chance. A woman scorned is a vessel of wrath, and my sister is a very determined woman. I believe I know how Miss Nightingale felt when she landed in the Crimea. In style. I shall begin the inoculations at once, Mr. Wilson. Uh -huh. Leave them alone for tonight. They're in a panic. There's half the village dying in its tracks. You stay inside your hut where you'll be safe. Till I say you can take the air. Why? Well, because, because you need to be taken care of. But I'm not afraid. Look here, now. You hit the hay. Huh? There's an American expression that means to go to bed. Oh, it is expressive, isn't it? Yeah. Good night. <laughs> One more peep out of you, my girl, and I'll spank you. So you can't sit down. Oh. La, 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 la. La, la, What's the matter with that kid? Is it typhoid? It may be. It's difficult to make the rose rash diagnosis on such dark skin. What are you going to do? Inject serum. Hey, but mightn't that stop... Will you wash your hands, please? Yes, but she's the headman's daughter. Listen. You see, they're getting restless already. If she should die after a shot of that, it'd be us who'd killed her. It'd be sticky for us, you know. Will you wash I... your hands, please? Yes, ma'am. It's all right, baby. Of course it hurts. I had a tooth out once and I yelled so hard it rang the church bells a mile away. She doesn't understand English. Oh, it's never the words. 
It's the way you say them. You have such a gift for language, Mr. Wilson. Thank you. Hey, it sounds as if it's going to rain. it will cool them down a bit. I don't think they'll attack when it's raining. Think I'll go out and see what's going on, though. Mr. Wilson, you're wet through. You've been standing out there in the rain for hours. Do come in and have a cup of tea. Cup of tea? Yes, yes, I've just made tea. Come in. Well, thank you. I'm afraid I can't offer you milk. Never was much of a one for milk in my tea. I say, how is the kid getting on? Oh, no change yet. Do you take sugar? Thank you. No, 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 no. Ah. Any of your thoughts, Mr. Wilson? You know, it's sort of swank sitting down to tea in this godforsaken spot. Well, it's not godforsaken now, Mr. Wilson. There. I hope you like this. Yes. Yeah. You look fine. Oh, you mean this old thing I'm wearing? <laughs> I, I meant the tea. Yeah. Do you... Do you mind if I, uh, smoke? Uh, no. Edward? Thank you, Martha. Look here. Would you mind if I told you something? No. But before it's too late, I, I'd like to tell you why I've carried such a chip on my shoulder, Buster. What's that? It's a spear. Get back from the window, will you? Oh, they're like a lot of kids. When I was a kid, I used to march around the house yelling and walloping a drum. I'm sorry I got you into this. Blasted woman's place is in the home. <laughs> I say, are you laughing at me? No, no. I never have. Really. You haven't? I don't really mind. You know, I'm used to it. I was the fat boy at... I was the fat boy at school. Uh, they used to call me Jack Spratt. Jack Spratt could eat no fat. His wife could eat no... Oh, I mean, of course, I didn't mean that. Well, that's all right. We'll keep the platter clean anyway. Hmm? One does have to think of expenses, I suppose. Well, let me tell you that argument that two can live as cheaply as one is so much twaddle. Oh, I'm not prepared to admit that. It's simply a question of household management. Yeah, with a manager getting all the salary. Does that mean you've been married? What, me married? Bro. What's the matter with it? You've only got to look at the papers. Shh. Look, look, her fever's broken. Hey, you sure? Yes, see, look. Look, she's smiling. Hey! Hey, Chief! Chief! Your kid's gonna get better! Hey, Chief! Oh. oh, hello. Where do you come from in England? Kent. I come from Bucks. You know, I, I'd like to tell you something I started to tell you once before this evening. It's the reason I carried such a chip on my shoulder about your preaching. Hey, will, will you give me a hand? You see, uh, at home, in England, I wanted to marry the local barmaid and become the landlord of the Fox and Rabbit Inn. My father and I had quite a scene, you see. Uh, my father was the vicar of Little Hazard, Bucks. Oh, my father drank himself to death. I say, I say, look at the baby. <laughs> Pretty, isn't she? Look, she wants to grab my finger. Children <laughs> know, Edward. They always can sense a family man. Wow. Thank you, Charles Lawton, Elsa Lancaster, Jean Herschel, and Reginald Owen for a swell performance. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our stars step before the beautiful silk curtain, ready to take part in our weekly feature, The Question Box. Remember, Elsa, Charles, Reggie, and Jean, you've got to answer my questions correctly or pay any forfeit I name. Everything clear? Well, one thing puzzles me, Raj. What's that, Jean? I hope I can ask you to be a little bit Yeah, well, you see, I... Hey, what is that, double talk? No, just a little Danish. <laughs> oh, he's trying to confuse us. That isn't fair, is it, Johnny? Well, no, sir, it isn't, Raj. We wouldn't try to confuse him. In fact, folks, we certainly wouldn't want to confuse anybody. So right here and now, we want to explain just why we use the word octane rating when we talk about Gulf no-nox gasoline and exactly what octane rating means. Octane rating is the way scientists measure the ability of gasoline to resist motor knock. 
Now, at one time or another, almost all of you car owners must have noticed an unpleasant pounding, pinging sound in your engine, especially when you're going up a steep hill or accelerating suddenly on the level. Now, that's a motor knock, and it's a sure sign that your motor is not working smoothly, that you're losing power, and that you may have a repair bill to pay later on. And yet, many motorists find that they can end motor knock just by stopping at the right pump, the Gulf No Knox pump. For Gulf No Knox gasoline has been raised to such a high octane rating that it banishes motor knock under all normal driving conditions. No regular gas of any make, no matter what claims are made for it, gives you as high an octane rating as No Knox. That's why no regular gasoline can possibly give you the same protection against motor knocks. Now, that's only common sense, just as it's only common sense to get this extra protection by stopping at the sign of the orange disc for Gulf No Knocks, the knock-proof gasoline. Thank you, John Conti. And now for the question box. The first question goes to Elsa Lanchester. Ready, Roger. All right, Elsa, tell me. What movie star is very much younger than Richard Green, Errol Flynn, or Robert Taylor, yet has more years of acting experience than the three of them combined? Lionel Barrymore. Oh, <laughs> oh no, I'm afraid that's not quite right. <laughs> the answer is Mickey Rooney, who made his first professional appearance at the age of nine months and now has 18 years of acting experience behind him. And, Elsa, for your for- forfeit, you must recite Mary Had a Little Lamb as Popeye the Sailor would do it. Oh. Um. Mary had a little lamb. Its feet was black as soot. And into Mary's cup of milk it put its dirty foot. I can't go on because it hurt. <laughs> Thank you, Elsa Lanchester. And the next question goes to Gene Herschel, who's heard each Wednesday on his own program as Dr. Christian, and whose latest picture for RKO was Meet Dr. Christian. Gene, tell me, were Gary Cooper, Charles Lawton, and Tallulah Bankhead ever in a picture together? Yes, they were. Remember what it was? Mm, I believe the name of the picture was Devil in the Deep. That is absolutely right, Gene Herschel, and thank you very much. Incidentally, Salula Bankhead, along with Fred Allen, Robert Benchley, and John Charles Thomas, will appear in the Gulf Theater next week from New York. And here's a question for Charles Lawton, who can now be seen in Paramount's Jamaica Inn. Tell me, Charles, can you uh, tell me if Jeanette McDonald has a sister in pictures? I don't know. She might or she might. <laughs> well, that's quite true, but I'm afraid it's not quite right. <laughs> no, Charles, uh, I'll have to give you the forfeit. Jeanette McDonald has a sister in pictures, and her name is Marie Blake. And for your forfeit, you will imitate a duck eating weed. That's not fair. I never shot that. It should be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Best I could do. Thank you, Charles Lawson. Ladies and gentlemen, before we say goodnight, we want to extend you an invitation to tune in next week when we bring you from New York such stars as Fred Allen, Bob Benchley, Tallulah Bankhead, John Charles Thomas, and, of course, Oscar Bradley and his Gulf Orchestra. Listen in, won't you? And now to you listeners, I'd like to say, gee, but you're swell. And for your good Gulf dealer, I'd like to tell you what a real big thrill it gives us to know it's folks like you who listen to us. Honestly, gee, but you're swell. Be with us again next week, won't you? Good. Until then, this is Roger Pryor saying, good night, everybody. This is John Conti saying good night for your neighborhood good Gulf dealer. Reginald Owen's latest MGM picture is The Earl of Chicago. The Gulf Screen Guild Theater originates in Earl Carroll's Columbia Square, Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Gulf Screen Guild Theater. The director of the Gulf Theater and your host, Roger Pryor.
Good evening, everybody. Your neighborhood good Gulf dealer and the Gulf Oil Companies again welcome you to the Gulf Theater, which tonight is adding the lights of its blazing marquee to the brilliance of New York's Times Square. And what a cast those lights spell out. The one and only Fred Allen, the jovial gentleman from Town Hall tonight. Bob Benchley, radio and movie star, critic and humorist. The famous Metropolitan Opera star John Charles Thomas. And, of course, the music of Oscar Bradley and his Gulf Orchestra. Up until the last moment, ladies and gentlemen, we had expected to present still another great star, the glamorous Tallulah Bankhead. But unfortunately, Miss Bankhead is indisposed. You know, we're all getting a big kick out of broadcasting in the Gulf Theater from New York for the next few weeks. But whether it's Hollywood or New York, the stars always look forward with special pleasure to appearing in the Gulf Theater. That's because the Gulf Theater is the star's own theater. You see, every single cent that Gulf would ordinarily give to the stars who appear here is given instead to meet the needs of the Motion Picture Relief Fund and to build a home for the members of the picture industry who can no longer provide for themselves. The lights here in the Gulf Theater are growing dim. That means it's time for Oscar Bradley and the Gulf Orchestra to raise the curtain with a hit song from Jerome Kern's brand new musical play, Very Warm for May. The song is All the Things You Are. <laughs> As I told you a moment ago, ladies and gentlemen, tonight the Gulf Theater had hoped to bring you the outstanding stars here in New York. Circumstances, however, have grounded our lofty ambition. And, admitting defeat, we bring you instead Fred Allen in person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Roger Pryor. Well, we're certainly starting off in a Hollywood atmosphere, you saying circumstances... And uh, I particularly enjoyed that one bo- uh, that one bell send-off you gave me, Roger. <laughs> oh, I was only kidding, Fred. You know, try- trying to get a laugh. Trying to get a laugh. Well, you don't have to try very hard with that mustache, do you, Roger? <laughs> Your top lip is truly a rhapsody in fuzz. <laughs> Well, now, Fred, I'm sorry you don't like Oh, no, no, I was, I was only, uh, only kidding, Roger. I'm really one of your greatest admirers. Are you, Fred? I listen to you every Sunday. As a matter of fact, I, uh, I have to listen to you at 7.30 to get the taste of a certain radio buffoon out of my mind. <laughs> but uh, enough about toupee trivia, Roger. I'm certainly glad you're here. Are you, Fred? Now, oh, now, look, don't pin me down, Roger. <laughs> 
if we both start telling the truth around here, it's uh, going to be very embarrassing. I must <laughs> say, do you, uh, you know, that mustache of yours intrigues me. It looks like a blowout patch on a mink raft. <laughs> Don't hide it. Your sight adds to these laughs, too, you know. But uh, it looks... Uh, and then again, at another angle, it, uh, it looks like a fawn's kneecap to me. <laughs> now enough of my lip. How about getting on with the show, Fred? All right. Let's stop beating around the bush. Now, there you go about now my look, mustache now look, again. Now, oh. <laughs> now, look, Raj. Cross my heart. I'm, I'm glad to see you and welcome you to New York. Say, uh... What brings you here from Hollywood, Roger? Well, I'll tell you, Fred. No, no, I'll tell you, Roger. I know that you read that uh, Mayor LaGuardia is going to have moving pictures produced here in New York. You wanted to come east and be the first to present some of our new New York movie stars to your radio audience, right? Well, if Manhattan has any movie stars, Fred, we'll be more than glad to put them on. Well, that's the trouble, Roger. Mayor LaGuardia just told the industry to come here. He hasn't appointed any actors yet. When I heard that the Gulf Theater was coming here, I ran all over New York to find some local movie stars for you. And your search was fruitless? Well, not entirely fruitless. I did get a raspberry in one neighborhood. <laughs> well, then I take it you couldn't find a New York movie star. Only one. Midway up a frowsy blind alley in Astoria, I did find a little man cutting capers in front of a picture camera. Another man was there walking excitedly up and down. But it was the first man who caught my eye. He was obviously a movie star. Well, did you bring him over, Fred? What's his name? Oh, his name. I forget. It was Finchley or Wenchley or something. I've got him right here, though. I'll ask him. What, uh, what is your name again, bud? Uh, Benchley. Robert Benchley. Bob Benchley. Ladies. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I really haven't done anything to deserve this demonstration, or have I? <laughs> Picture stars don't have to deserve their demonstrations, Mr. Benchley. I can never understand why an audience always applauds a picture star in person. Well, perhaps it's because the audience hopes the movie star will keep making personal appearances and stop making pictures. <laughs> You've uh, got something there, Mr. Benchley. You mean this lump on the mic, <laughs> <laughs> That's my lunch. I'm on vacation. <laughs> well, you, you are a movie star, aren't you, Mr. Bentley? Well, that's a matter of opinion, Mr. Pryor. When people say to me point blank, are you a movie star, Benchley? I don't answer. That leaves it up to them. In many cases, I get the benefit of the doubt. What is that conjunction? Cain says <laughs> Well, it was all right. We, uh, we don't mind you coining a word on here, but when you start counterfeiting... <laughs> counterfeiting... <laughs> Why, you must be a movie personality, man. Why, I caught you up an alley over there in Astoria with a camera. Yes, I was making a trailer for a short. Say, <laughs> a lifetime's work in Hollywood these days. <laughs> Who was that other man with you, your director? Oh, he was a picket. Oh, a picket? You can't go into business today without a picket. <laughs> oh, you're right. Before I start a picture, I always get a picket, and I call up the receivers... That does away with me, the middleman, and gives me more time to myself. <laughs> a very happy arrangement. I find it so. But then again, as I often say to myself, who am I? <laughs> You're Bob Benchley, aren't you? <laughs> oh, so I am. <laughs> My amnesia is embarrassing. Amnesia banished me from Hollywood, you know. Really? Yes, the last film I made, Metro kept the picture and released me. <laughs> Hey, Roger, this chap is a movie star. Well, then, welcome to the Gulf Theater, Mr. Benchley. Do I have to go with a unit or anything? <laughs> no, no, this is the same studio Major Bowes uses, and uh, I imagine a lot of people tuned in will think it's Thursday night. <laughs> but uh, we, don't, uh, we don't have to go with a unit. We leave here in an armored truck? <laughs> no, that we won't know until we see how the rest of the program turns out. Well, here's your movie star for you, Roger. Now, what do you generally uh, do with these stars when you get them in the Gulf Theater here? Well, it depends, Fred. Sometimes we interview them. Ask them how they got into pictures, their favorite foods and books and hobbies. Well, fine, like fine. Would you, or would you mind telling us your favorite things and stuff, Mr. Benchley? <laughs> well, I won't tell you, but you can wring it out of me. <laughs> what fellow says? <laughs> what fellow? 
<laughs> we drag a stranger into this? No, no. Three will make it rather stuffy here at the microphone. <clears throat> well, all right. Now, first, Mr. Benchley, where were you born? I was born in a small prefabricated house, which I helped my father to send for. <laughs> now, the program is long tonight, so your early life has been cut. <laughs> You don't mind, do you? See, there's first best years of your life gone. Uh, I understand that you're a Harvard man. Yes, my father accidentally gave me a crew haircut, so I had to go to Harvard. You had no choice, of course. You finally graduated from Harvard? No, I left as a result of a petition. You did? Well, how did you get into pictures, Mr. Benchley? I was chosen Mr. Delaware Water Gap in 1970. <laughs> talent scout saw me. I had something on him. In no time, I was in Hollywood. You made your first picture, and... Uh, they had something on me. In no time, I was back in New York. For good? Well, I may step out occasionally. Wildlife is my hobby, you know. Oh, uh, are you a jitterbug, Mr. Benchley? No, I've got a Mexican jumping bean in my vest. That's what keeps my suit going up and down like this. What is your favorite book? Volume 6 of the Encyclopedia Britannica, Coleb to Damascus. <laughs> what is your favorite joke? My favorite joke? Mm -hmm. uh, cranberries are grapes with high blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> that joke slays me somehow. <laughs> Cranberries are grapes with high blood pressure. <laughs> I, uh, I heard it the first time. <laughs> well, it doesn't get funny to have heard it 80 or 90 times. You should live so long. <laughs> I have. <laughs> well, I'm afraid I've run out of questions, Roger. I've gotten the best out of him. Have you anything... To... <laughs> well, have you anything to ask, Mr. Benchley? Yes, Fred, I have. Uh, what do you think about moving the picture industry from Hollywood to New York, Mr. Benchley? Well, I think we can do it, Roger. It might take two trips. <laughs> but if we put our shoulders to the wheel... Do you, uh, do you uh, honestly feel that New York can produce pictures like drums along the Mohawk, Mr. Benchley? Oh, why not? We can make piccolos along the Coconas, oboes over Oboken, fiddles over Philadelphia. <laughs> Personally, I'd enjoy seeing Hollywood come to New York. Well, I wouldn't mind most of it coming, but that, of course, brings up a certain cinema nobody again. Now, wait a minute, Fred. Jack Benny's a friend of mine. Benny hasn't got a friend, Bob. Why, even his shadow doesn't like him. Did you ever meet Jack Benny on a sunny day? His shadow is always on the opposite side of the street. And when I say shadow, I don't mean Rochester. Oh. Now, hold on, Fred. Jack Benny belongs to the Screen Actors Guild. Look, Benny doesn't even belong to the human race. <laughs> He's still up for membership. Well, aren't we all? But you can't condemn Jack for that, Fred. Have you heard what he's been saying about me on his program lately, calling me Frida, a female impersonator? <laughs> he's too cheap to write a letter. He's using his program for blackmail. <laughs> then he's so cheap, he wouldn't give a dying plant the dew off his upper lip. <laughs> well, Jack always speaks well of you, Fred. Why, that rat. I'd like to be a cat for about two minutes. <laughs> Benny, in my estimation, is a yawn with skin on. <laughs> Excuse me, Fred. Uh, look, Roger, I've got to be going now. <laughs> i got to go out and give my owl a mouse. <laughs> me, me too, Bob. I'm I getting a timetable for Hollywood. Hollywood. The sooner Hollywood comes to New York, the better. If the picture industry comes east, Benny will be left out there alone. And that's the only way I like Benny alone. <laughs> Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, boys, boys, this uh, this hilar uh, hilarity is all very flattering, even if it is coming a little late. Oh, we weren't laughing at you, Mr. Allen. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry I spoke. But well, don't tell me you were guffawing at Benchley's new uh, Bal McCann. No, no we, we weren't laughing at that either. <laughs> well, before somebody puts me in a padded cell, will you break down and tell us what you were laughing at? Oh, we're laughing at winter. <laughs> At what? Well, uh, Fred, I think I can explain this. Everybody can laugh at winter now, just by stopping at the sign of the laughing man outside your neighborhood good golf station. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who live up north, your good golf dealer is ready with the new golf antifreeze. A permanent type antifreeze that saves you money because it won't boil away. Then, for motorists everywhere, your good golf dealer has that extra pure golf pride motor oil. A quick starting, free flowing oil that eases the load on your battery, on your starter, and on your temper. Also, to make Gulf's winter service complete, there's Gulf Flexing, registered lubrication with the new Gulf Flex lubricants. Here again, you get tops in protection, because Gulf Flex lubricants have been perfected especially to meet the needs of all modern automobiles, including your particular make and model. Your car will ride and steer easier, longer when you get a Gulf Flex lubrication job at your neighborhood good golf dealer. So don't wait another day. Stop Monday where you see the sign of the laughing man. Change to Gulf Pride Motor Oil and get ready to laugh at winter with the help of that good golf service. Thank you, Harry Von Zell. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we take you to Chicago, where Huntley Gordon, one of the most famous of the silent picture stars, and now an executive of the Motion Picture Relief Fund, is waiting to present our next star. Thank you, Roger. All I want to say is that it's the spirit of such artists as the one standing here beside me that has created the Gulf Theater. For he interrupted a concert tour here in the Midwest to sing to you tonight. And so from Chicago, we bring you the thrilling voice of John Charles Thomas. Now, what are you going to sing, John? Huntley, I have a new song written by one of the original members of Screen Guild and a very dear friend of mine, William Worthington. The song is called... Someone like you. Someone like you makes the heart seem the lighter. Someone like you makes the day's work worthwhile. Someone like you makes the sun shine the brighter. Someone like you makes a sigh a half smile. Life's an odd pattern. Briars and roses Clouds sometimes darken No sun shining through And the clouds lift And the sunlight discloses Near to me Dear to me And now, Carol Hollister and I want to give you that grand old song by Jerry Kern from the showboat, Old Man River. Dark is all work on the Mississippi. The dark is all work while the white folks play. Pulling them boats from the dawn to sunset. Getting no rest till the judgment day. Let me go away from the Mississippi. Let me go away from the white man, boss. Show me that stream called the River Jordan. That's the old stream that I longs to cross. Old Man River, it's Old Man River. He must know something. 
But don't say nothing, it just keeps rolling, it keeps on rolling along. You and me, we sweat and strain, body all aching and racked with pain. Don't get barked, lift that veil, get a little drunk, and you land in jail. I get weary and sick of trying and tired of living and feared of trying but on my river it just keeps rolling Thanks to John Charles Thomas. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Gulf Screen Guild Theater acknowledges Mayor LaGuardia's effort to bring movies to New York and presents the man who will introduce the man who will start the ball rolling, Fred Allen. Thank you. The, uh, it says applause. Didn't the audience get scripts here? It says applause in here. <laughs> Thank you. That's why I should finish if I had any sense. But, uh, but thank you. The ball uh, is the eight ball, ladies and gentlemen. And as we start it rolling, we find Mr. Benchley snug, snugly behind. That pays up from Spencer, did you? Tonight, Mr. Benchley dramatizes the first moving picture scenario thrown out of Mayor LaGuardia's office. All right, Oscar. <clears throat> Greetings, friends. As we fly over the blue Atlantic, we find ourselves nearing two of the lesser-known islands of the Caribbean group. They are called simply Iwana and Shidawana. <laughs> Nowhere will you find a more helpful and delightful climate than in this paradise of the Atlantic. It is cool in summer, warm in winter, April in Paris, and six ball in the corner pocket. Iwana is noted for its similarity in government to the more democratic countries, and its citizens are allowed complete freedom of speech. Even political prisoners are given every opportunity to voice their views. We come now to a public square where an open trial has just finished. We listen. Please enough. Step forward. Well, no doubt there is something you would like to say about your trial. Come, amigo, do not be bashful. Tell us. What is on your mind? Well, <laughs> next case. <laughs> so we leave the court of inhuman relations and travel on through the island. Walking through the streets, we notice a native family clustered around a crude hut. There is a tiny baby playing in the dirt. He is N A K E D. Or, as they say in India, naked. <laughs> the child has his mother's eyes, his mother's nose, and his mother's mouth, leaving her with a pretty blank expression, if you ask me. <laughs> but let us hurry to the marketplace of Iwana. Here we come upon a true old world bazaar. So we pause and speak to a young man who's passing. Young man, will you step up and tell us what caste you belong to? No casting this week. Me lay off. I see. Well, you don't seem very depressed about things. I presume you've got a few acres of land and some livestock up in the hills. I got plenty of nothing. <laughs> and nothing plenty for you. Thank you. We pass on through the bazaar and notice many tropical flowers are being sold by lovely native girls. Ah, but what is this? A beautiful native girl, seeing that we are a stranger steps slightly forward to offer us the bountiful hospitality of the island. She speaks. Mala, bid you welcome. Mala put lovely gardenia on handsome stranger. Oh, thank you, Mala. Handsome stranger is grateful indeed for beautiful flower. That'll be a quarter. Get the idea? 
So we leave the pretty Marla and her two-bit gardenias and stroll about the island for a glimpse of the men industriously working in the field. Although it is generally believed that the hot tropical sun makes men lazy, this is far from the truth. For everywhere we look, we see cheerful workers rolling and tossing in their sleep. <laughs> we wish to observe more of their modern improvements on this quaint island, so we proceed directly to the radio station. We enter one of the studios and listen to a native who is broadcasting. Good evening, senores. Buenas noches, senores. Parmiente for Sande Laguna Parmiente. This is Bob Hope. <laughs> Just a minute, young fellow. I happen to know that Bob Hope is in California. Don't be silly. That isn't Bob Hope out there. That guy is Fred Allen. Fred Allen? Well, I happen to know Fred Allen is on this program. Oh, you mean the fellow that calls himself Fred Allen? Isn't he Fred Allen either? Certainly not. He is Robert Benchley. Oh, he is? Well, then who am I? Dorothy Lamour? <laughs> no, Dorothy Lamour is Tony Galento. <laughs> then who's the real Dorothy Lamour? Me. Ain't I beautiful? <laughs> Now it is time to take our reluctant leave of the lovely island of Iwana. And as we turn our way homeward, the sun, a hot ball of fire, sinks into the cool sea. Somebody please tell me when Mickey Mouse goes out. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry, my good man. But you seem to have made a mistake. We uh, we don't show pictures here. Eh? What's that? I say this is no movie theater. This is the Gulf Theater. The Gulf No Knocks radio program. Eh? Gulf No Knocks. No Knocks. Nope. Don't wear bow knocks. <laughs> I like the foreign hand better. Uh, well, here's a pretty kettle of fish and dead fish at that. Well, Fred, maybe I can help you out here. I think my voice is maybe a little heavier than yours. You ought to be able to hear me. Uh, look, my good fellow, Mr. Allen said no knocks. Can't hear you. <laughs> Yeah, you're no help. <laughs> Gulf no knocks. You know, the gasoline that ends motor knocks under all normal driving conditions. Still don't know what you're talking about. Listen, friend, you know those knocking, pinging sounds that you hear in your engine when you're going up a steep hill or when you try to accelerate quickly in traffic? Those are motor knocks, and they cut down power and hold back your car. Well, now, Gulf No Knocks helps end motor knocks. It gives you a higher octane rating than any regular gas, and therefore more protection against wasteful motor knocks. Just try Gulf No Knocks. See how much smoother and more quietly your car runs. See if you don't feel it's the right gasoline for your car. Right gasoline? I heard that. Well, it ain't neither. You don't know what you're talking about. What? And I heard that one, too. Can't scare me into changing my mind. The right gas is called no knocks. Will you now, will you give up, Harry? Yes, I guess I'd better, Fred. I've only got about enough voice to say to our friends, drive in at the sign of the Gulf Orange Disc for a tank full of Gulf no knocks. The knock-proof gasoline. Thank you, Harry Von Zell. And so, ladies and gentlemen, as the lights begin to dim in the Gulf Theater, may we invite you to be with us next week when we will present from New York Helen Hayes, Frederick March, and Oscar Bradley and his Gulf Orchestra. And now to you listeners, I'd like to say, gee, but you're swell. And for your good Gulf dealer, I'd like to tell you what a great big thrill it gives us to know it's folks like you who listen to us. Honestly, gee, but you're swell. And so be with us again next week, won't you? Good. Until then, this is Roger Pryor saying good night, everybody. And Harry Bonzel saying good night for your neighborhood good golf dealer. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.